uh, by participating, uh, you are giving your consent to be recorded. And um, we do thank you for taking your time on this uh, beautiful spring day to join us. Uh, we'll be talking today about uh, growing apples and pears for the home gardener. Uh, so we do like to start every class by saying we, <laughs> we don't always know every single thing about everything, but um, we definitely put together a lot of good information for you all. And uh, hopefully we'll give you a lot of really good resources. There's a lot of information that we're not going to be able to cover uh, step by step or in great detail when it comes to things like uh, spray schedules and some details like that. But uh, we will give you a lot of really good resources. Actually, it looks like we've lost. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. So. Um, we are recording and I just wanted to say that we'll be giving you a lot of good resources along the way. So well, while we're waiting for Ashley to come back, I'll just introduce myself. I'm Sherry Frick. I'm from University of Maryland Extension and Ashley is my coworker. Okay, can you guys hear me now? Yep. <laughs> All right, so as Sherry said, we are with uh, University of Maryland Extension. Uh, so our contact information is here on these slides. And we will be sending a copy of the presentation out to you all within the coming days, as well as a link to the recording. So you'll have that for your, for your reference. So uh, we do work with University of Maryland, uh, which is part of the College of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Uh, one of the programs that Sherry and I are both um, responsible for in our counties is the coordination of the Maryland Master Gardener program. So if you all are interested in learning more about that, please reach out to us. Um, every state in the United States has um, a land grant university system. And within that system, there is the extension service. So we encourage you if you're not from Maryland or not from Garrett or Allegheny counties, which Sherry and I work extensively with, uh, to reach out to your county and your land grant university. So why are we going to start talking about apples and pears or why would we want to grow apples and pears? Uh, so botanically speaking, they are called home fruits and apples and pears are managed similarly uh, because of the way that they grow and because they both are uh, home fruits. I did want to just uh, point out that in order to get, you know, fruit that looks perfect, like you might find at a grocery store or farmer's market, um, it can require a lot of spraying or uh, pesticide applications. Uh, now, I do want to also make note that there are organic options for uh, pesticide choices, uh, and Sherry will be uh, covering that as we go along. One of the big advantages that you might uh, want to grow your own uh, apples or pears is that there are so many different varieties available. And as Sherry is going to talk about, a lot of the times they're broken down into different uses. Um, so depending on what use you're looking for for an apple or pear, maybe it's to preserve it, maybe it's to make cider. Um, by growing your own, you are just opening up a whole wide world of possibilities. You also have greater control over, you know, how much pesticide is applied, um, and that can give you really a good peace of mind. Uh, the other thing that um, really is appealing to me with apples and pears personally is that they have a much longer storage life. So whenever I'm looking for things to take to like the farmer's market to sell or something like that, uh, your stone fruits like your peaches and your um, you know, cherries and things like that, they have to be sold and turned around pretty quick. Uh, whereas your apples and pears, you have a much longer shelf life and you can store them um, under the right conditions for a lot longer. So I find that to be a lot more appealing too. So just a couple um, things that we wanted to point out here as we're beginning is that not only is growing apples and pears a big investment of resources um, and potentially space, um, it's also a big investment of time. So we're going to talk about, you know, how to plant and what to choose and that sort of thing. But um, it, it is going to take time. So whenever you plant a majority of these, you're not going to get fruit for at least three years and probably closer to five um, before you're going to get, you know, fruit off of, off of this investment that you're making. So that can be a little bit uh, frustrating 
um, for for gardeners that get super excited and just want to kind of you know go out and buy something on a whim um, that can be a little bit difficult too when it comes to apples and pears uh, so these were some helpful tips uh, that were on some of the fact sheets that we'll share with you at the end of the presentation that we use to put the presentation together. Um, but, you know, your success is going to depend on a lot of things. We're going to talk extensively about site, you know, when you're looking to plant these, these fruits, uh, what kind of site you need. Um, we're going to talk a lot about how you can manage them successfully, and that's going to be anywhere from finding the, the right spray schedule to uh, pruning correctly. Um, the other important thing is to match the fruit that you want to grow uh, with with what's with you know the size and space that you have available. So we'll get into the each of these a little bit more as we go along. So the basics to start, we're going to start with light, hardiness, known zone, pH, soil type, space, and then purpose. So as with any garden vegetable. Uh, you need at least six to eight hours of direct sunlight for your pears and apples. Um, and that's going to be important to get best fruit production. Um, that can also help with reducing disease issues. Uh, the more sunlight they get, the quicker the foliage will dry out. Uh, it can also be helpful with um, helping with our pollinator friends. Uh, for some of them that need to be cross pollinated with a with an animal pollinator. If it's in direct sun, um, that's going to give uh, the bees and other pollinators a more opportunity to be active because it's going to be warm. So as we go along, this is one of the sites at my mom and dad's where we uh, decided to plant an apple tree a couple years ago. So as you can see, it's full sun. Um, it's not really, you know, it's not the top of the hill, it's not at the bottom of the hill, um, and it's not surrounded too close by buildings. Uh, the next thing we wanted to talk about was uh, you know, depending on where you're joining us from, we have the information for Maryland and more specifically for Garrett County here listed on this slide. But if you go to planthardiness.ars.usda.gov, this website here that we have listed, this will help you find your United States Department of Agriculture cold hardiness zone. And this is going to be super important when you're talking about finding a fruit tree that's cold hardy in your area. And not just fruit, but also, you know, any type of perennial that you're looking to put into your yard or add to your landscape. So this is what the site looks like. Uh, once you put in your zip code, it's going to bring up the specific information for that area. Uh, so as you can see, this is for, you know, the entire state of Maryland here on the right. So you have to be careful whenever you look at, you know, mail order catalogs or something like that. Uh, they may say this plant is great for Maryland. Well, Maryland is quite variable in its uh, hardiness zones. It goes all the way from the coast at eight um, up here to the mountains where, where we are, where, where Sherry and I are, um, to, you know, right around a five or a five B. Uh, so that means it can get anywhere from, you know, negative 15 to negative 10. Um, and that's, you know, probably on uh, the generous side of how cold it generally gets. So be, be forewarned to figure out where you're cold hardiness then is when you go to find um, apples or pears to add to your landscape. Uh, generally, apples can go anywhere from three to nine on the hardiness zones. And you may be surprised to think that, you know, that there's a limit on, you know, an upper limit. Uh, but apples and pears do require chilling hours. Uh, most apples take at least 1200 hours or chill hours to break dormancy the following year. So if they don't get enough cold, and that cold is anywhere from 32 to like 65 degrees. So if you go too far south, um, apples and pears are not going to be very successful. Uh, they're going to have a hard time breaking dormancy because they're not going to get enough cold hours. So um, if you are in any of these zones, then they are good options for you. Uh, we just wanted to also mention that uh, you want to be mindful of microclimates. So you know, a lot of times at the bottom of a hill, it's going to be a little colder than at the top, uh, depending on which side of the hill you're on. And you may get sun earlier in the day than if you were on, you know, like the south side. Uh, so just be mindful of that. You want them to get the most warm uh, sunshine that they can as early as possible. Uh, so study your property whenever you are getting ready to plant these or add them to your landscape uh, so that you can find the right site. And this is just more information, uh, you know, 
how do they calculate cold hardiness zones? What well, has to do with spring frost dates and fall frost dates and how many days in between you have of growing season and how cold it's going to get. Uh, so just uh, you want to be mindful of that. And a lot of online sites now are very helpful when you're looking for these uh, apples and pears. Uh, they can tell you, you know, if they leaf out early or if they bloom early. Uh, so you can kind of compare that to your spring frost date. So if you're, you know, used to getting a lot of late spring frost, like we are here in Oakland, uh, you know, we can usually get frost up until the beginning of June. Uh, so it's really important for us to find varieties that are going to bloom later in the season in hopes that they won't get frosted and killed. Uh, the next really important thing that we need to adjust before we get ready to plant is the soil pH. Uh, and you can figure out your soil pH just by getting a simple soil test. I think every soil testing laboratory, um, you know, in the area or in the United States is going to test for pH. And the important thing to do is that we want a pH of somewhere around six and a half, six point five. And if you look, this is uh, a chart that we use quite often. Uh, but it tells you um, what availability the nutrients have at certain pHs. So it's, if you look here between the 5 and the 6.5 zone, uh, you can see that all of the macronutrients and many of the micronutrients are most available in those pH ranges. So if you have a pH, you know, down here around 4, uh, it doesn't really matter how much nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, uh, you would put on or add to your soil, it's not going to be available to the plants. So um, that's really not helpful. And again, it's best if you can amend the soil the year before you're going to plant. So like the fall of the year, especially with um, if you need to add lime to raise the soil pH, uh, because it takes time for that lime to react um, with the soil and to break down and really uh, adjust the pH. Here's some more information on soil. Uh, most pears and apples are gonna prefer a sandy loam to a sandy clay loam. Uh, so kind of like a lighter soil, a lighter soil texture. Uh, and the, you can amend, you know, amend your soil um, needs based on a soil test. So again, we generally recommend that you get a soil test done by an outside laboratory. A lot of the home testing kits may not be reliable, especially if you get it from a big box store and it's set there for a year. You know, the, the elements that are needed to measure some of those items, uh, they may be outdated or they may not have been stored at the correct temperature. So we generally recommend an um, actual, you know, sending the sample away to get it analyzed. And from here, I am going to turn it over to Sherry. Okay, thanks, Ashley. And I'm just going to ask you the, four, the slides for me. So another basic thing that you need to consider when purchasing your trees is um, the mature size of your trees. Because um, you can, you have the option to get dwarf size trees, semi dwarf or standard size trees, and they have different size um, spreads and heights. And you're going to be able, to, you're going to need to be able to accommodate for those uh, differences in wherever your planting site is. And you're only gonna be able to fit so many trees in one place to be able to, you know, if you're gonna be able to space them properly. And you want them to be spaced properly so that you get good air circulation in between them and uh, a good, good sunlight. And a dwarf is generally considered, it could be as, as short as six foot, um, six to eight feet, maybe even 10. And you're gonna to wanna to place them about eight feet apart in a row. Whereas semi-dwarf trees are a little larger. They could be 12 to 20 feet tall. And you wanna space those about 12 feet apart in a row. Standard size trees are pretty much the largest size trees you're gonna get. They could be 25 feet tall or more. And they've gotta be 20 feet apart. Next slide, please. All right, for pears, um, many of the pears that you're gonna buy, especially if you get them at some place like a box store or a nursery, they're gonna come on um, standard size seeds or stand, standard sized um, rootstocks. 
and they're going to be your larger size trees and they're going to need to be about 20 feet apart. There are some dwarfing rootstocks and you can place them a little bit closer. Go ahead, Ashley. So another thing that you're going to want to consider when you're choosing your apples and pear tree varieties is what are you going to use them for? You may want to can pears. You may want an apple that's good for cooking. Maybe you like to make apple pies. Um, maybe you just want them for fresh eating, so they should be dessert quality. Maybe you want to do cider. Um, disease resistance is always a very important thing to consider when choosing your, your varieties. Also, maybe you want to be more self-reliant, so you may choose a variety that stores well over the winter and it's going to last a long time in storage. And maybe you're adventurous and you want to try an heirloom variety. So there's all kinds of reasons or all kinds of purposes um, that you may want to consider in choosing your variety. And these are just some um, selections that I've put up here for you, just you know, under different categories. And I think scab resistance is a, a really important characteristic that you may want to look for. And uh, some scab resistant varieties that I found were Pristine, Williams Pride, Red Free, Freedom, Priscilla, Liberty, Sundance, Enterprise, Gold Rush, Mac Free. And there's probably some more out there. Whereas your cider varieties are going to be very different because you want to use them for a very different, you have a very different purpose for them. And, um, it's important to have the, you know, the, the acid and the sugar balance right. Maybe you want something that has more complex flavor. So then you would look for these varieties if you're gonna make cider and that could be fresh or it could be hard cider. Now, if you're looking for a winter storage apple, one that's gonna last a long time and keep well over the winter, you might want Newtown Pippin or Crispin, Cox's Orange Pippin, Enterprise, Golden Russet, Gold Rush, et cetera. Next slide, please. Some pear varieties, generally they come in uh, two types. You can get European or Asian. And under European, you can see some names that are probably pretty, um, pretty uh, familiar to you. It could be Anju, Bartlett, Bosk, Gorham, Harrow, Kiefer, Magnus, Moonglow, Seckel. And under Asian, you have uh, Shinseki, Kosui, Kosui, Olympic 20th century, and I believe there are other varieties as well. One thing to note about the Asian pears is they tend to be uh, smaller stature trees, but they do bear at an earlier age. Next slide, please. So apples and pears are usually grafted on the rootstocks. You may have heard us mention something about rootstocks before. Um, so the way that um, this goes is you generally have your rootstock variety, and then onto that is grafted the particular um, cultivar or variety that you want to grow and to eat. Say you want a honey crisp. So the honey crisp um, variety is the scion part that's then grafted onto a rootstock. And this is generally how you're going to buy most apple. And it's a uh, scion that is grafted onto a different rootstock. Okay, go ahead, Ashley. Okay, next we're going to focus on a pollination needs. So in general, pears and apples are not self-fruitful. There are a few out there that are partially self-fruitful um, and very few that are completely self-fruitful. Um, so what that means is you're gonna need to have a pollination partner. So you can't buy just one apple tree or one pear tree for the most part and expect to get a good yield of fruit from your tree. Next slide. Okay, so some apple pollination basics. You need to have your pollinator, your partner, within at least 50 feet, but 20 feet is really probably even better. So the partner or your pollinizer um, has to be a different variety or a different cultivar of the same fruit species. 
So if I wanna grow, let's say a wine sap apple, I need to have another apple, say a Honeycrisp, that would be its pollinizer. Whereas if I had pears, then I would have to have two different kinds of pears. Okay, so you don't, you can't go to the store and buy two Granny Smith apples and expect to get a good fruit crop. They have got to be different varieties. Another thing that you need to consider is that um, varieties that are close to each other in genetically, like if they share the same parents, they also are not gonna provide good pollination for one another. Um, and bloom, the one that you choose, the bloom time must overlap with that of the other tree. And we're gonna talk more about pollination groups in a moment. Also, you need to consider the, um, the ploidy, which is a, a, an odd word, but it has to do with the genetics of the tree, whether it's diploid or triploid. And as you can see, just getting into this, you really got to do some research to figure out which trees are compatible for one another. And just to add to um, information on pears, it's very similar to apples. Um, you've got to have at least two varieties in order to get good pollination and fruit set. Um, Asian and, and European varieties are actually compatible with one another. However, they don't usually bloom at the same time. They don't have sufficient bloom overlap. Next slide, please. So that's where we come to the idea of pollination groups. So the simplest way to see if two varieties could pollinate each other is according to what pollination group they are in. And this is even an arbitrary way to group uh, fruit trees and it's based on when they bloom. So usually you, it ranges from, it's given a, a number like one and it may go up to four or it could be given a letter and say A through D, okay? And the say number one is gonna represent those trees that bloom the earliest, whereas number four would represent the group of, um, of apples, say that group, that, excuse me, that bloom the latest, okay? So what you're gonna need is to find varieties that flowered about the same time. They ought to be in the, the same pollination group, get the best, um, cross-pollination. However, you can uh, choose a, a variety from an adjacent group, one that was earlier or one that was later, as long as you're getting sufficient overlap in bloom time between those two groups. Next slide, please. I really like um, this particular website. So you, that sounds kind of complicated, right? You got to check all these different things to make sure if your variety that you want to grow is compatible with its partner or pollinizer. Um, I found that um, this particular website, Orange Pippin Fruit Trees, has got a really great tool for home gardeners. Um, if you want to check to see, you know, what varieties are compatible with one another as far as pollination goes, you can go to orangepippintrees.com and you would just type in the variety that you want to grow in this, there's a little box over here on the lower left-hand corner. And then it's gonna bring up all the different pollination partners that would work with that particular variety. And this is not the only pollination checker that's out there. You can find other ones. And sometimes when you order trees online from nurseries, they will also uh, do you, you know, give you the service of letting you know which other varieties will be appropriate pollinators for the, the, the cultivar that you want to grow. So that's an awesome way to check. Um, and let's see, rootstocks, uh, just a side note, rootstocks can also affect when your particular cultivar is going to, to flower. For example, if you had um, an apple growing on an M, M106 rootstock, it may tend to flower a few days ahead of um, the, the same apple grown on a different roots, rootstock. So let's say you had um, a red delicious growing on MM106. It might bloom a few days before a red delicious that was on um, an M26 rootstock, okay? Uh, whereas 
the opposite can be true. Certain rootstocks root can actually cause a variety to delay flowering by a few days. So, the, so these are all things that you, you need to keep in mind when choosing your pollination partners. Now, what's ploidy? So ploidy has to do with the number of sets of chromosomes that an organism has. Now, most you know, humans are diploid. So you get one set of chromosomes from your father and one set of chromosomes from your mother. And with two sets of cr uh, chromosomes that would be considered diploid. Now, most apple and pear trees are the same way, but not all. In the, uh, in the plant kingdom, you can actually have for, uh, plants that have three sets of chromosomes and we call that triploid. Now, the thing to understand about this is that a triploid cultivar cannot cross pollinate other varieties. And if you have a variety that is triploid, then you are gonna need two pollination partners, not just one. So that means if I were to choose a variety such as Liberty, which is triploid, I would have to buy two other trees that would be compatible and could provide pollen for the Liberty tree, as well as each other, in order to get good fruit set and a good yield on my apple trees. Okay, but um, one advantage of triploid trees um, varieties is that they often are, have very good disease resistance. Next slide, please. Okay, so now we're gonna focus on rootstocks. We've been mentioning rootstocks quite a bit here. So we're just gonna delve into this um, a little bit deeper. So this is just a nice little graphic that can show you how rootstocks can um, alter the size of the mature tree. And you have a range from smallest to largest, M9 being the smallest and MM111 being the largest. And I like the little person that's drawn next to um, the M9 tree. It kind of gives you a, a, a size uh, comparison, you know, the scale, so you have an idea. Um, now, what are the reasons why people, you know, graft scions of the variety that they want to grow onto these different rootstocks? Well, it's because rootstocks can give you several advantages growing in trees. It can help to control the, the size of the tree when it's full grown. It can also um, make sure that the tree produces at an earlier age. It can impart some disease resistance. Um, it can also um, be, or give the tree uh, more hardiness. It could be more cold tolerant or just be a more vigorous grower. You can go to the next slide, Ashley. So, and I was just talking about some of these things and you, you might be surprised to find out that people have actually been um, using rootstocks and grafting the scions onto the, the rootstocks for about 2000 years. Um, and I've already mentioned the reasons why people have done this uh, because it does help to give uh, size control, gives disease resistant, could be earlier bearing. Um, and dwarfing rootstock can make picking, pruning and, and uh, pest control like spraying your trees a lot easier and you get your, which is a real perk, is being able to get your fruit at a younger tree age. If you just had a standard size uh, root stock that your tree was growing on, it's gonna take you a lot longer to get the fruit. And if, and another thing that I ought to mention is that if just say you took a seed from an apple and you planted it in the ground, well, yes, you would get an apple tree from that, but it's not gonna be genetically identical from the parent tree that you got that fruit from because that tree or that seed was produced through um, sexual reproduction, which means the genetics um, are, are mixed and matched, okay? You get a genetically unique individual from each seed. So they're not gonna necessarily come true to the parent tree. So that's um, 
another reason why we do the whole root stock with the variety grafted onto the root stock. Okay. And um, I already mentioned earlier that the root stocks are generally grouped into dwarf, semi dwarf, and standard size. Okay. And uh, pears, there hasn't been quite as much development on root stocks for pears as there has been with apples, uh, especially when you go to buy a potted fruit tree at a nursery or a box store. They're going to come most likely on your standard uh, root stock, which is actually a Bartlett tree uh, root stock. And it, it, it has been, it may have been grown from a seedling. So it means it's going to be really tall. I mean, it could be 20 feet, 25 feet tall, and it's going to take longer for it to produce fruit. Now, there has been some work done on pear root stocks. Um, one that has been developed that is has what well, has some resistance to fire blight would be a cross between Old Home and the Farmingdale varieties. And this can also impart some dwarfing to the pear tree. Also, quince, which may be a fruit you have heard of or maybe not, but quince is um, an old fruit variety that people used to grow more often than they do now. It's kind of like a cross between an apple and a pear. Anyway, um, pears can be grafted on to quince, quince rootstocks and uh, the one quince A actually has some dwarfing capability, but it is susceptible. Sherry, so, are you there? Yeah, can you hear me? Okay, yep, good. connection is unstable, so I apologize for that. So now I'm going to walk you through how to decipher some of these codes that you might see, especially if you're going to order uh, your trees online from a nursery, which actually I suggest you do. And I think Ashley is going to get into this a little bit more later about how do you pick your plants, how do you order them, how do you plant them. But the advantage that you have with ordering trees from an online nursery is that often you can choose the variety that you want and the root stock that you want. Whereas if you go to a box store or a nursery where they're already planted in a container, you most likely are gonna just go with the standard, um, normal run of the mill, whatever root stocks um, that, are, that people generally use, which would be these M series, the M, the MM, might even, you might even get an EMLA variety. But what does this mean? Okay, so M refers to the Malling Research Station in England. So I think it was sometime in the 1900s, um, some researchers in England, you know, they, they knew that there were many different types of rootstocks that have been used for, you know, a couple thousand years. And there was about 24 of them out there floating around. So they asked themselves, are these all really actually different from one another or are some of them the same thing? So they did some research and in the process of sorting out all these different root stocks, they gave them a, a number or a letter and a number. So they gave them an M and then you had, you know, one through 24 or whatever. So they went through them and figured out which ones were actually different and ones were the same. And so this is where we get the M series. Okay. And we'll take a look at these numbers a little more in a minute. Now, some of your root stocks might be labeled MM, and this stands for a joint effort that was between the English research stations of Malling and Merton. And then you may actually see EMLA. And this was a joint uh, effort between East Malling and Long Ashton research stations in England. Now, what they try to do with these was they actually tried to remove some of the viruses that were latent in the roots, in rootstock varieties. And as they removed the viruses, it actually um, caused these rootstocks to be a little less dwarfing. Okay, so, so they, they don't dwarf as much as the MM or the Ms. Okay, so you can see that most of this research was done by the folks in 
and Great Britain. Um, and then we have some other European countries that started to, to do some of their own research. Russia produced the Budagosky, Budagosky, you know, that's a hard one to say, Budagosky series, um, which great about this one is that it's spread to be very cold hardy and it all, also many of these rootstocks um, are resistant to fire blight. And then in the good old US of A, uh, Cornell University developed the Geneva series. Now the Geneva series um, has a lot of dwarfing capability as well as resistance to various diseases, especially fire blight and crown and root rots. And they do have some resistance to some, some insects like woolly apple aphid. Now here we see a chart that is gonna compare these different rootstocks with one another according to how long it takes for the, you know, a, a, a scion grafted onto it to bear fruit, how far apart you should space your trees that are grafted under these roots, average yields, and the useful uh, lifespan. So if you look first at the dwarf root stocks, which is gonna be, you know, produce the smallest trees. These are the ones that are gonna be between six and eight, maybe, maybe 10 feet tall. Um, you have your M9 or your bud series, bud nine. Um, these are gonna allow your fruit trees to bear in two to three years. And, but you should also notice that with these dwarfing rootstocks, they generally reduce the lifespan of your tree as well. They don't live as long as a semi-dwarf or a standard tree, okay? Now, when you're looking at the spacing, the first number, 10, if we're looking at the dwarf rootstock, um, it says 10 by 20. The first number represents um, how close your trees should be planted in a row or right next to each other. And the second number represents how far apart your rows should be from, from each other, okay? So if you look up at the semi-dwarf, um, most frequently would be M7 or M106. These are the typical um, rootstocks that you would find on your box store plants, okay? Um, the the semi-dwarf, as you'll notice, they allow the fruit trees to start bearing anywhere from three to five years after planting. And uh, you wanna space them about 15, maybe even 20 feet apart. And they do live a little longer. They've got 20 years of life in there. Okay, so I thought I would just show you this. I think it's a nice graphic to, that compares these um, M series and the Geneva series, <coughs> excuse me, to give you an idea of how they compare to one another in size. So you see they range from the smallest here on the left all the way up to the, the standard or seedling size tree on the right. So if you wanted a, a dwarf rootstock, most of them are gonna come um, as M9s, you know, and that's the typical one. If you were wanting to get a Geneva rootstock that is more disease resistant, then you would go for, and, and that has that same dwarfing capability, you go for G11 <clears throat> or, or some such thing, okay? So you can go to the uh, Cornell University. Uh, we will give you the, the link to that and you can check out this comparison chart between the uh, Geneva series and the M series. And just, I think it's a nice uh, comparison to help you make your decision. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, and I don't expect you to be able to read this. I just wanna bring it to your attention. Um, at the same website, it will give you a comparison chart um, that compares the Geneva apple root stocks and these M series as far as not just size, but um, how they compare in resistance to woolly apple ape, aphid, fire blight, um, crown and root rot, cold hardiness and the, and the list goes on. So that's also a nice tool when you're trying to make a decision about what root stock you want. Okay, so this, uh, this comparison of root stocks, you know, what are their um, capabilities and maybe perhaps their susceptibilities uh, is developed by the Corn Cornell University. And um, I'm not gonna read through all this, but I just wanna point out that even though, um, you know, I could say all the mauling series, all the M series, you know, yes, they dwarf things, but each one also has other attributes that you may want to read up on because some may do better in different cultural 
situations, okay? The M26, um, it tends to be poorly anchored to the ground and it's gotta be planted in well-drained soil and it can't tolerate very dry conditions. So if you live in some place like Allegheny County where I work, it's very dry there. Um, so you may not want a tree that's grafted onto M26. Whereas M27 is a semi-dwarfing root and it has deep roots and it is very good at anchoring your tree to the ground. So you're less likely to have your, your tree blown over. Um, another thing with these dwarfing root stocks is you have to be careful with them. Um, they have to be staked. And whereas your semi-dwarf trees generally don't have to be staked, but dwarf trees do because they have a, they can have a weak graft union and a weak um, uh, anchorage to the ground. So just keep that in mind. All right, next slide, please. Um, and I wanted to highlight, you know, you have these Geneva series. Um, these are highly resistant to fire blight. Is your, your rootstocks G16 and G30. G16 is comparable to um, the M9. It's dwarf, dwarfing. Um, G30 would be semi-dwarfing. And then I think the, the bud series is also very good. It's, uh, it gives you um, fire blight resistance and cold hardiness as well as um, dwarfing. And that one's more, uh, yeah, that one be more like the G16 or the M9. And for pears, you should probably consider um, the old home cross with the Farmingdale root stock, you know, as far for its disease resistant qualities. And it does dwarf your tree. Okay, I'm sorry. I just have to give a shout out to University of Maryland on this. This is one of our new apple cultivar release, releases. Um, it's Antietam Blush. And uh, I actually found it for sale on a, an online nursery and I was all excited because I knew that they were gonna release it soon, but they actually have released it. So this is a dessert type apple, one that, you know, for fresh eating. Um, it has been developed specifically for um, mid-Atlantic summers, which tend to be hot and wet, humid, you know, which are you know, breeding grounds for lots of diseases. So this particular apple is uh, somewhat resistant to fire blight. So, you know, this is a great choice. Uh, if you live in the mid-Atlantic, you might want to try it. And a shout out to uh, Dr. Christopher Walsh and his graduate student, Julia Harshman, for their development of this. Next slide, please. Okay, so now we're gonna get into disease management and resistance. Not so much that I wanna focus on what each of these diseases is and what chemicals you need um, to fight these specific diseases, just to make you aware that diseases are a real issue for apple and pear trees. It's, um, you pretty much can't get away from it, okay? Apple and pear trees are, are difficult to grow and expect that if you do nothing, you're gonna get a good yield. Um, because you're always gonna be fighting insects and diseases. That's why we would like to encourage you to focus on choosing those varieties that have disease resistance, okay? So I just wanna familiarize you with some of the common diseases of apples and pears. I pretty much can't get away from them. They are ubiquitous in the environment. You are gonna encounter them at one point or another. So probably the one that's most common is scab, which is caused by a fungus. And there's scab on apple and scab on pear. And from these pictures, you can, you can see what it does to the fruit. It, it produces these corky lesions. If it's bad enough, it can you know, turn into a crack. It can pretty much make it, you know, large portions of your fruit um, unusable. The next disease is actually a bacterial disease that can be devastating to trees. It can actually kill entire branches and entire trees. Um, it's called fire blight. The other one is cedar apple rust, which is um, actually a really interesting one. This is a fungal disease that requires two different hosts. It requires the um, Eastern red cedar as, um, part, as a host, as well as apples, hawthorns, and pears. Um, as the other host. So during the course of its um, life cycle, it will develop at one point on a cedar tree and on the other point uh, on an apple hawthorn or pear. And it does cause um, uh, 
deformation to fruit and it can reduce your yields and it affects the leaves as well. Now powdery mildew is also one that you're gonna commonly encounter. Uh, you may have noticed this disease before, it's a fungus, it, it kind of creates this like a whitish, silveryish coating on your leaves, <coughs> excuse me, which can um, reduce your leaves ability to pho photosynthesize and that's gonna decrease your yield. It can also um, affect your shoots and your fruit in development. So it will decrease yields. Next slide, please. All right, so some apple varieties uh, that I have mined for you from Cornell University, University of Maryland Extension and Penn State. These are our varieties that are resistant to at least um, two of those diseases that I mentioned, some of them even three. So um, we have Williams Pride, Red Free, Freedom, Priscilla, Liberty, Sundance, Enterprise, Gold Rush, Mac, Pristine, and Jana Free. Next slide, please. Um, now this group uh, of apples is resistant, resistant to cedar apple rust. That's Jersey Mac, Liberty, Macintosh, Molly's Delicious, and Red Free. And I got this information from University of Nebraska. And you can see from the pictures there, that's what um, the disease looks like on the leaves. That's that fungus for cedar apple rust. And if you were, if I did show you a picture of what it looks like on hawthorn, the fruit is completely unusable. It's, it's not quite as bad on apples and pears, but it will make the fruit somewhat unusable. Okay, next slide, please. So here are your fire blight resistant varieties uh, for apples. Liberty, Bright Gold, Priscilla, Pristine, Melrose, Sundance, Viking, Williams Pride. Or, and I should have mentioned with the last slide, or you could graft it onto rootstocks that are resistant to fire blight. So let's say you want an apple variety that's not on this list. Say I wanna grow a Newtown Pippin, but that is not a fire blight resistant variety. I could go to a online nursery where I can choose the rootstock and say, all right, I want a Newtown Pippin, but I want it grafted onto a G16 or a G30. And then you could get resistance to diseases um, for that particular variety that you wanna grow. Uh, and the same is true for um, the other diseases. You, if the variety that you wanna grow is not resistant to those diseases, you could try and find it graft grafted onto a rootstock that is disease resistant. And that rootstock will impart some disease resistance to the tree. So, so that's great. Next slide, please. Okay, so some pear varieties with some resistance to the fire blight would be Harrow Delight, Magnus, Moonglow, and Seckle, or you could get the variety of your choice grafted onto the uh, OHXF uh, rootstock. Okay, next slide. All right, some fungicides and insecticides and antibiotics that you can, um, that would be most commonly be used by home gardeners in, you know, in a spray schedule to help protect your, your trees from diseases and pests. Now, with all of these, you have got to read the label in its entirety before you use the product. And you have got to make sure that it is labeled for use on what you are going to spray it on. It's got to be labeled, if you're going to spray it on an apple tree, it's got to be labeled for ap apples. So if we take a look at fungicides, you'll see Captan is possible fungicide that you could use, but you cannot use it on pears, okay? You could also use copper, lime sulfur. Maneb is also not uh, for use on pears. Uh, Pristine is actually the brand name, but the active ingredient is pyroclostrobin. Uh, Bordeaux mixture is interesting. It actually has fungicidal properties, as well as bacterial, um, antibacterial properties. And that, that's a mixture of copper sulfate and uh, quicklime. And then you have your uh, insecticides that would be most available to homeowners, um, Aza Direct, NBT, Carbaryl, which is seven, would be the brand name for that. Horticulture oil is pretty, um, you know, low risk and, and then you have imidacloprid, which is not available to um, homeowners in Maryland. You have to have a pesticide license in order to buy that one. Uh, 
out of those is which ones would be organic um the bt would be organic some um pyrethrum i believe is and spinazad and surround those are organic and your low risk ones would be soaps and hort oil um as far as fungicides organic would be uh oh. copper lime sulfur neem Okay, I'm not sure about border mixture. And then uh, the antibiotics or bacteria sides are specifically for, um, oh, now it's slipped my mind. The uh, fire blight fire blight. and, yeah, thank you. And the active ingredient in that is strep. If it's, if you're up. Oh, one more slide. Or two more slides. Okay, so um, this is just to let you know that you can go online and find some great resources for uh, spray schedules. I, I really like this one from Purdue University, and we'll give you the link to this one. But in the beginning of the guide, it gives you pictures of all these different stages of development of your trees. Because when you go to look at the spray schedule, it's gonna, it's not gonna tell you a date. It's not gonna say, okay, April 1st, you need to do this. It's gonna say, all right, at bud swell, you need to spray this for this pest and this disease, okay? So this chart helps you to figure out, well, what does bud swell look like, okay? Um, so I find that to be really helpful. And then next slide, Ashley. Um, this is just an example of what the, the spray guides look like from this particular guide. I have your apple spray guide and your pear spray guide. And it's gonna list, you know, what you do at each stage of development for the tree, you know, the flowers, um, and what particular pests or diseases you might need to spray for at that point. And then it will tell you which chemicals that you can use. So if you are gonna, you know, you're gonna go all in and you, you are gonna be really um, diligent about spraying. These are great guides. And uh, also keep in mind, you're gonna have to get some spray equipment uh, in order to do the spray. Uh, so you have to ask yourself, am I gonna be you know, very good about doing these spray schedules and just choose whatever apple variety I want? Or do, am I probably not gonna be so good about spraying things? Or maybe you like, I don't want chemicals put on my fruit um, of any sort. If you're that kind of person, then you want to try and find the most disease and pest resistant varieties out there to make your life easier and so that you can get a decent yield of fruit from your trees. Okay, Ashley, I'll give it to you. All right, thank you, Sherry. So we have a couple of questions in the chat. Do you want to check those out and answer them or you want to wait till the end? I will try to answer them while you're talking. Okay, thank you. And if not, we can do them at the end, whatever you prefer. So as Sherry was talking, um, there's basically two ways that most folks are gonna uh, purchase their trees. So they either will be potted, so usually from somewhere local where you're gonna drive and get it, not be mailed, or they're gonna be bare root. And most places are either going, to, again, you're gonna get them at the store or you're gonna mail order them. So there's a couple advantages to both, both options. Um, if you were to do a mail order, uh, you have a lot greater selection of cultivar and rootstock. Uh, Sherry has talked extensively about these wonderful rootstocks and all the different uh, benefits. It can be a little overwhelming, um, but there's so many different options if you can uh, go the route of mail order. Um, you can also, again, have a more uh, variety in what size of uh, tree you're going to purchase. Uh, so sometimes that can help speed along uh, actually getting fruit off of some of these varieties. Now, the advantage to just going to a local store or nursery would be that it's more convenient uh, because they are potted trees. They're probably going to be a little bit older. Uh, so that can help you to get fruit sooner. Um, and you're probably going to have more of an option with when you can plant. Uh, as long as the, the store doesn't sell out of the, the tree uh, that's potted, they're going to keep it all season long. Uh, whereas with most of your mail order, you're going to get those in early, you know, March or April, depending on your climate, they will mail it to you based on your zip code. 
So if you do get bare root, again, this is what you get. Uh, they just come prepackaged usually in some peat moss with some moisture, uh, like a wet paper towel or something similar in there to keep the roots hydrated. Uh, it's always a good idea to soak those roots uh, six to 12 hours before you're ready to plant. Um, it's also important to know that when you receive these uh, trees, you want to get them out in the ground as soon as possible so that they don't bud out. You don't want to keep them like in a heated garage or, you know, inside your house. Uh, you want them to still be dormant if your trees outside are, are dormant. You don't want to plant them, you know, you don't want to leave them in your home or in a nice warm environment where they are going to bud out and then put them outside where they're going to be killed back by frost or cool weather. Okay, so proper installation, if you are gonna either do bare root or, um, you know, a potted tree. Uh, these are just some pictures that are kind of hard to see, but if you lay the, uh, the roots out uh, wherever your planting site is, then you can, you know, mark off the area that you want uh, to dig. So you know how big of a hole you need to dig. Uh, here in this, uh, my finger is pointing to, you know, how deep it would have been planted in the, at the nursery where this uh, bare root came from. Uh, just some points to pick, you know, to see. Um, one of the fact sheets that we'll share with you, I think it was Purdue says, don't plant a $10 tree in a 10 cent hole. Um, you know, it used to say that, you know, you should dig the hole twice as big as the container. Um, a lot of that research kind of went out the window saying that wasn't as good because that just kind of gives the roots a false uh, sense of security of what the soil could be like. Um, and used to say that you should amend the soil whenever you plant it, you know, put like compost or something in the hole. Again, I've read some conflicting information that says uh, that just makes the roots want to stay within that area. Uh, so they're not as likely to, you know, reach out and grow into the expanded area. So that's not always good either. So it's best just to backfill the hole with, with your native soil that, that the roots will be growing in. Yeah, and here's just some pictures you can see uh, here on the right, that is the graft union. Um, and you never want to cover the graft union with soil uh, because that could make it revert back uh, to whatever the root stock is. So just important to whenever you get your tree, make sure that you find uh, that graft union before you plant. And then you wanna keep it you know, two to three inches above the soil line. Uh, watering is super important, especially for the first whole year of that new tree's life. Uh, you want to probably water weekly, especially if you live in a dry area. If you're getting weekly rainfall of around an inch, uh, you might be able to skip that. Uh, but the more uh, often that you water these trees, the better established they'll be and the less likely they will to have transplant shock, um, which is always going to be good for the overall health of the tree. And then we get into pruning. So most of the time, apple, pear, pecan, and plums are all going to be pruned to what we call a central leader, where you're going to have just one uh, main shoot coming up from the base of the tree. Uh, that's called the leader. And whenever we talk about branching, uh, we want to make that central leader, you want to prune that off. Uh, right about 20, between 24 and 36 inches. We usually say around 30. Uh, so once you make that pruning or header cut, uh, that's going to help encourage the lower branches to start growing on the trees. Uh, so this is a lot of information for one slide, but here on the left-hand side, again, usually an apple and pear tree are going to have an overall A shape, whereas a cherry and a peach are going to be, you know, an inverted A or a V shape. So that's different. They have multiple leaders on these other two types of trees. Uh, some different terminology that you're going to hear whenever you do start to prune um, is, you know, some of these spurs. A lot of the time, the majority of your fruit are going to be is going to be bared on uh, the spurs that come up. So whether those are water sprouts or, you know, uh, fruiting spurs, uh, you definitely don't want to prune a lot of those back once your tree gets to be fruiting age, okay? Uh, apples, pears, cherries, and plums, they all are gonna produce best on, uh, produce their best fruit on two to three year old wood. Uh, so again, you don't wanna go in and prune everything off, um, you know, all at one time because then you're gonna eliminate your fruit in the, in the coming years. 
Uh, so it's really important to study the pruning that you want to do, what you want your tree to look like uh, to the day that you plant your tree. You know, you probably want to go in and actually make this header cut again, which can be a little scary. <laughs> it is for me because you just always you just planted this brand new tree and then you think you have to go in and, and prune it. But that is the best for the overall growth of the tree. And you usually can get two options. You can get either a whip, that's often what comes from a mail order, they're usually cheaper. Uh, and basically it just looks like a stick, there's no other, you know, no other twigs or anything else coming off of it. Of course you'd have your roots down here at the bottom. Uh, or you could get a feathered tree, these are usually your more older trees, they're going to be more potted often. Uh, what you'll find are at the stores as potted varieties where they already have some, you know, scaffolding branching coming off. Usually your feathered trees are going to produce one year earlier at least, uh, but they're a little bit harder to get and a little bit harder to grow. And just a few other things we wanted to mention. Uh, you want to be sure that you protect your trees, your young trees from deer and also from weed eaters or weed whackers. Uh, the cambium layer on your trees are going to be, you know, right underneath that bark layer. So if you take a weed eater and you get too close to it, or you have a deer that's rubbing their antlers on it, if you kill that cambium layer or disrupt the flow of, of sap and water, that's gonna kill that tree. Uh, so you wanna make sure that doesn't happen. Um, additionally, uh, mulching is a great thing to do. You wanna keep your grass and your weeds at least 12 inches away from the, the trunk. Now this picture, uh, the red X came and bounced over. This is exactly what you don't want to do. You don't want to make these mulch, oh, sorry, these mulch volcanoes. Um, you, that will kill the tree that can cause it to rot. Again, you could cover up the graft union. Uh, you want to, you know, go at least probably five or four inches back from the trunk and then start to mulch, okay? Uh, mulch can make it more attractive for voles and insect critters to live there. So you just don't want that. Um, here's an idea of you can use like um, hardware cloth to create a, a layer of protection if you do have live in an area where you have a lot of voles being active. And you want to keep your mulch two to three inches deep. Again, not right at the base of the tree, but out a ways. Um, don't, don't do this. Um, and that will help make it more, you know, less attractive to voles. And you should use wood chips or bulk bark mulch for the best results. And then uh, we get a lot of questions uh, through extension with fertilization, you know, how often should I fertilize my fruit trees? Uh, the short answer is that fruit trees need very, very little fertilizer. Uh, we do recommend two weeks after planting that you give them a dose of 10, 10, 10, about eight ounces. And you don't wanna put that in the planting hole ever, uh, but you do wanna put it around the base of the tree. Um, so they say two foot radius around the tree. Uh, on a mature tree, that would be what they call the drip line. So wherever the, the furthest out branches are all the way around the tree, that's called the drip line. And then the following years, you just want to increase it by a quarter of a pound um, until you get to two and a half pounds uh, for dwarf trees, five pounds for semi-dwarf, and 10 pounds for standard trees. Uh, so again, but really very little actual nutrients that you are going to be applying. And you can uh, kind of gauge if your trees need fertilized or not based on how much growth you're seeing. So a mature apple tree, you should see new growth come in nine to 15 inches per year. Uh, so, you know, don't look at it in the spring, but through the end of fall, as long as you're getting a good bit of growth um, on that tree, you probably don't need to really fertilize that much. Uh, so whatever you do, again, we put this here in red, this was information from the fact sheets. Don't overdo the application of fertilizer. Uh, too much fertilizer can actually be just as bad as not enough, especially when we talk about nitrogen fertilizer. Um, that can be very harmful and make your tree too leafy and not produce fruit. Another tip is that you could plant your, you could paint uh, your trunk with a latex paint, the 50-50 ratio of water to paint. Uh, this can help with bark splitting if you live in a cool climate. This information came from uh, University of New Hampshire uh, to help reduce bark splitting. Um, so you can see this is the graft union here and they've just painted the bottom two feet of that tree 
with the 50% water, 50% latex paint uh, to help keep the sun rays away by reflecting that white paint helps to reflect the sun uh, and keep the bark temperature a more even uh, temperature. Uh, these are some of the sources that we use, a Cornell Growing Guide to Growing Fruit at Home, Midwest, Midwest Home Fruit Production, Fruit Production for the Home Gardener with Penn State, uh, Managing Pests in the Home Garden, uh, that was again from Purdue, another Penn State, and then of course, University of Maryland. Extension has some really good sources on the Home and Garden Information Center. So with that, I will uh, turn it over to Sherry for questions. Do you have anybody want to talk about live or did you get most of them answered? Anything I can help with? Uh, let's see, I, I think I answered them, but um, we can go over the answers. It looks like we've got another message here at the bottom. Oh, thank you. Okay, so let's see. Um, someone was asking, okay, do dwarf trees need to be staked forever? Yes. Um, they, they should be staked from the time you plant them until they die. Um, they, they can have weak um, scion graft unions. Uh, so if you have a strong wind, it could break at that graft union. Also, their rootstocks tend not to be anchored as well into the ground. Um, so you want to avoid, you know, windstorm blowing your tree over and breaking it. So yes, dwarf trees do need to be staked. Um, gala uh, is susceptible to many diseases. There was a question about the disease resistance of gala. Let's see. And someone, Leonard had a question, I think about Granny Smith. Now, what's interesting about Granny Smith is that is one of those, you know, unusual varieties that is actually self-fertile and you can get a, you know, a pretty good yield off, off of them all by themselves. Um, Leonard, I wasn't sure if you had any other questions about that. You might want to type it in the chat box. Let's see. And someone was having problems, maybe Olga, um, with her, her trees aren't producing as much fruit as they used to. And gosh, there can be all kinds of reasons why your trees aren't fruiting as well as they used to. Um, probably one of the number one reasons is because people don't prune. Uh, you do need to prune in order to encourage your trees to produce more fruit spurs. And you're going to put out, that's what's going to put out the flowers and give you more fruit. So pruning is very important. Also, if your tree is under any kind of disease stress, um, you know, all these diseases that we've uh, mentioned, they are going to reduce the, the, the yield in fruit that you get. Um, if you have a root rot disease, that's going to limit, you know, your tree is just not going to do very well. Um, of course, they also need to be in full sun, not getting enough light could also be an issue or could be um, uh, a nutrient issue. If you look at the leaves, if they're yellow, uh, you might need to add some, some nitrogen. I don't think you, you might, you probably won't need to in, add anything else, but nitrogen could be a limiting factor. Um, let's see, any more, oh, three new messages, okay. Um, yes, we will send a cut. We're going to make a, a PDF of this presentation so that you can read things uh, on, you know, at home. Also, we will give you links to important uh, websites or um, PDF, you know, informational things that we referenced in the presentation. And let's see. And I just added our email addresses again. If you know, once you guys get into growing your fruit, she does prune and she's still not getting good flowering. You know, um, I think if I remember correctly, you mentioned that the tree had the, the orange spots on it. That's probably a rust disease, and it's going to reduce the amount of uh, flowering and fruiting that you get. Could be other, maybe you have powdery mildew. If you have powdery mildew, it will also reduce your fruiting, okay? Because the powdery mildew can actually affect the flowers and, as well as the shoots. And um, so that's another big one really is a problem. So you're gonna need to spray, unfortunately. Okay. Uh, let's see. Okay, thank you, Nigel, for the kudos. Um, let's see. Oh, awesome. Oh my gosh, Nigel, I like the way you think. <laughs> yes. Thank you. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So you've got our emails there. <laughs> 
we can uh, communicate via email, but I appreciate that, Nigel. Um, any other questions? So we will be following up in the next week or so with the link to the recording um, and then a copy of the slides. So we thank you all for your time today. Yep. Sherry, great job. We great certainly do appreciate your time and attention. We went a little over and uh, we always enjoy meeting with you and sharing about gardening. It's our passion. So thank you for joining us today. All right, with that, we will log off. And if you guys have questions, follow up with us via email, but we will be in touch soon. Bye.